Okay. Um, then, uh, so when we are looking at, at our Java files like this, it becomes impractical and ridiculous to put everything under the same directory, right? When you imagine that, you know, this is our full project and we still have to add 230 something place uh, classes. I mean, this, this is gonna be, become impractical, unreadable, unmanageable, et cetera. So Java offers another concept that it's known as uh, packages where that uh, is essentially, if we go right click and do new, well, a package is just essentially a tree structure of folders that are organizing the classes. So when we, if we wanted to create a package, we just right click, go into package file, and then we can say um, edu, well, edu, usually the, the, the um, package names are in reverse TLD. So we can do UCLA, dot uh, extension dot JC Moreno. So it created all these files uh, coming from EDU, UCLA extension, UCLA, uh, JC Moreno. If we look at this directory, If we, where is it? Show and find. Where did it go? Finding files, would it be this one? No. This is the second time that I click on that. They used to have it like finding finder, but I suspect that it was unsustainable for the Windows guys. Uh, well, let's see. You know what? This is why we have other solutions. We can see that here we have an edu um, dot um, UCLA extension why is it not oh, ah, it's not with the dots it's in this particular case um, You can see that the structure of these guys is essentially the same. You know, like it's everything that we had separated via a dot is a subfolder in here. You might be wondering um, why. Well, first of all, we can zip a file and send a, a full Java program that way by zipping it and shipping it online. Uh, the other reason that why, why we do that other than making, making it incredibly hard to read and to negotiate things and, and write them down properly is that packages are also, can be also compressed in, a, in directories. So as you're trying to distribute them, just keep that in mind that the .jar file is a proprietary Oracle or slash Java uh, mechanism for extracting, for grouping all the files. So essentially subfolders and, and, a, and a zip file system. Um, so far, so good. Let me get some numbers while I get another spin drift. Okay, everybody's at nine, that's great. Um, so in the packages, you can see that now, for example, we're going to start making some classes here. Oh, I'm going to say name, name this as, uh, 
let's say, uh, Jose's project. And we have Jose's project that you notice this first line, package, EDU, UCLA, extension, JC Um And all these guys are our packages. And you can see how this class lives at the end of a little online, I mean, a little digital cul-de-sac, which is that package. Um, and you can see the structure. Let me see if I can make this bigger. Can you guys see that? Everybody's able to see it? Yeah, okay, so you can see that part of things. You can also create uh, different packages, like, you know, let's just create another one for another package uh, that we're gonna put at the same level as my as mine. We're gonna put um, Ali's. So that, that way we have now two packages under UCLA, EDU, UCLA extension. You have Ali and JC Moran. And if I were to create another class here in Ali, I'm gonna name it sample class. You're gonna see that this line package, EDU, UCLA extension, that all is working properly, it is added. That essentially tells Java, find uh, this class actually lives inside of this package and, and don't change it. Okay. Everybody good so far? Let's get some numbers about that part. Okay, doke. So here's what I want to do before we go go on to do more crazy stuff. Um, let's set up a timer of three minutes. Three minutes. Okay. On that timer, I what would like you guys to create um, a hierarchy of, um, of classes. Actually, let's do it. I, I want you actually guys to, to think, like I would like you guys to create a package that, a package structure with some classes. Let's just do it that way, simple. Just a few classes, a few, uh let's actually let's let's do a little bit more let's do six minutes six minutes so again the the assignment for right now is for you guys to create a combination of classes that inherit from each other you know grab an example from the real world and create some packages that represent that structure any questions okay uh, let's let's get then started, and um, I'll see you in six minutes for some examples that you guys are gonna show. Okay, so let's um, let's uh, see who came up with an interesting uh, class inheritance and packaging structure. Let's see. Let me stop sharing, and then so somebody can can take it and present. And again, by the way, this this type of, of exercises are for you guys to, uh, you know, number one, have uh, familiarity throughout class or also so that I can correct and provide feedback. And also your your friends can, well, your cowork coworkers, your teammates, classmates can uh, provide uh, feedback and, and so on. So um, let's say, uh, or should I toss a coin and then figure out uh, who would present? Okay, let me then grab a random number from a random number generator. Number between one and we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people. Oh, but it one and seven because I'm not gonna count Brandon for, for two. 
Okay, so we got uh, six. And in this list is one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, Josh, you are number six. You're muted. I didn't get to the part where I could uh, mess with the classes, but I set up some packages. Okay. Let's Sorry. see. It's that's fine. Uh, okay. Okay. This is me. You see me? Yeah. Okay. So my first package is media, and I divide it into uh, classes. Uh, regular television, streaming audio, streaming television. And then my second uh, package was providers, uh, Netflix, Spectrum, Spotify, as they pertain to the individual classes. And I was going to set the first three as abstract and the subclasses would be obviously Netflix for streaming television, Spectrum for regular television and Spotify for streaming audio. That is excellent. That is excellent. Uh, good job, good job. Um, Anybody has any comments, suggestions, ideas, kudos? <laughs> Nobody? Okay, good. Well, Josh, thank you for, for sharing this one. That, that, that one is good. Okay, excellent. Um, okay, now I'm going then back to my, to my screen. Um, where? So Juan? Yeah. At the top of the... So the line, the very first line, I guess, that describes just wh where the class is located. Yeah. Is it, yeah it's it, not really like like importing anything? No, it's just essentially okay. saying this belongs to this package. Okay, but that's an excellent, excellent question to this next thing. So if we want to start pulling classes from different places, we would use the class, um, the class, uh, I mean, the keyword import. So um, the keyword import essentially allows us to bring visibility or to have that class available some, somewhat for us. So for example, if we were going to do um, uh, anything with databases, we could, we could do java.sql and we can either import everything or just a class that we're looking for. So for example, we can do java.sql.connection or we could do, imp, you know, like java.net.star, and that will bring all the classes that are in the net package, java.net package, uh, uh, to, to this status. Now, if I have my main thing, and I just want to show, like, for example, what happens if I delete these two lines? And I do, like, um, connection C equals... Um, or you know, like just just as a pointer like that, it's gonna say that this class doesn't exist. So I I so if I Alt Enter on on that, it's gonna tell me which one do you want to use. So I'm gonna select Java SQL, and you see the moment that I that I selected that, it it added this line that says that I that it's now on reference. Now it knows where that reference is coming from brings it you know to the to the forefront so that way it knows that connection is related to this sql connection class um and same thing you know in, in some cases that that happens also with with the date class but i just want to make sure give give me some numbers guys on on import and package let's go into that into those uh, into those concepts oh yes saref Thank you for reminding me about VAR arguments. Oh, it went all the way to that. Well, so just to understand variable variable arguments, just real quick, you know, this is a Java two thing that I introduced it there, but I wanna I want you guys to know about it because we did have the dot dot dot. Uh, basically, we have public int. Um, We have, um, let's just throw a, throw a int um, items. 
And what this guy does, um, if we say int dot dot dot, or let's just add all the, the numbers and we say items, okay? And then we can do something like for int equals z i equals zero until i or while i is less than items dot length i plus plus okay and then we're going to do something like int result equals zero and result plus equals items i we'll return result so if i was going to create a class like this i could do sample class sc equals new sample class and i could start doing you know printing the output of um add and i can do two comma three and what that, that thing is going to do is that it's it's the equivalent as if i had something like add int x int y and the reason why it's called variable arguments is because you can then start putting five and six and then it's equivalent as if we had something like int um, z int a. So you can see how the arguments part starts growing and increasing and decreasing, right? Uh, and it doesn't matter how many we pass, it's going to actually always work out. So for example, you know, we, we are passing all these arguments and the sum of that is 14. I hope that added that, added that extra clarification. So that, that's something that's perfect for polygons, right? Where it could be four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah. That's why I included it there. Yeah. Because I wanted a polygon to be able to resolve the, the number of sites that your polygon had. And you didn't have to worry as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as somebody that was implementing the extension to polygon and all that. Does this all make sense? Okay, so we were then talking about imports and packages. So why would packages be useful other than, you know, organizing when you have hundreds of classes and things like that? Why do you think, like, can anybody think of any other benefit besides just organization? I suspect that Brandon has it on, on the tip of his tongue. I don't think so. <laughs> no? Okay. I'm going to give you an example. And th for this example, I'm going back to our slides. Okay. So um, for us to understand the benefits about the extra benefit about packaging, I would like to show this uh, slide. And this slide, here's what why it is important. Let's assume that we are writing an Android app. And we are uh, we are trying to write the sign-on capability for um, for your application, and that sign-on capability uh, is going to use a keyword account on on multiple um, uh, areas, right? So. Um, The keyword account is um, let's assume that you you know you're you're bringing in a Facebook account. You're gonna have it signing through Facebook. You're gonna have it signing through Google, and also you're gonna provide the capability of your your own signing process. You know, let's assume that this application was called um, I don't know. Let's let's think of something ridiculous. Um, armadillo book and it's a social network about armadillos so uh, that's why we have this a here so your app which 
you know, when I wrote this, it was a for app. But let's just think that you're going to make your social network for armadillo fans. And uh, and you're going to have uh, a Facebook account, a Google account, and an, and an armadillo book account. And as well, you're going to uh, store that information on as an internet account on your Android device. All of these guys have the keyword account. I mean, the name of the class account. Why? Because in the one from Android is known as android.accounts.account. On the Facebook one is com.facebook.accountkit.account. On the Google one is also, you know, their own packaging and account. And the other one is my app users account. So there's four accounts that could potentially collide. And packaging adds some unique namespacing to your application. So that way, things do not collide between other things. So you can see that the fully, quali fully qualified name for this class is com.myapp.users.account. Essentially saying there's this folder structure above it that uh, before you find that account thing, that account <coughs> class, but it does have a full path. Does this make sense? Am I explaining or, or am I explaining something like you guys are like, what the? Um, uh, let's actually, let's get some numbers. That way it's numerical. And uh, you guys can tell me if if I should navigate here or just continue. Okay, perfect. It kind of looks like a polymorphism or something. It's come, like what? Like, like polymorphism, but for like. Yes. Class. Basically, yes, it's, it's a way it's a way of doing that. But it's, you know, there are so many words on the English on the, on the English language. And most likely you're going to repeat some of them like you cannot expect somebody to call them um, a county or some other of, or, or some other mechanism to like try to like make the word a little bit different. You know, this is now um, oh, and, and another thing that is important. The way to organize all these data or the, the domain, you can actually see it very clearly here, is what it's called as a reverse uh, fully qualified domain name. So you can see, for example, and these are these are real packages. Uh, how we have with com.facebook.accountkit.account. Essentially, if you read it backwards, it's facebook.com, google.com, you know, like that, that's a common way of naming packages in a reverse qualified domain name. So. <laughs> When I am using this, uh, when I had uh, edu UCLA extension dot alley, it's essentially like the reverse uh, qualified domain name. And that, that is not necessarily a norm or, or a rule that the compiler is going to enforce, but it's a norm that enough developers follow, if that makes sense. I just think it's like really long. Yeah, even if it's long it will make it unique because if you have your own domain name, you know, like, like if, even if it was like Twitch TV, you know, that it's not necessarily a com, you can do, uh, you can do like import TV, you know, Twitch, yada, yada. Mm. Now it's in red because it's not detecting any package that is on that. Now, how come it doesn't detect a package? The question lies of that in a variable called the class path. The class path is an environment variable that if it's not set, you know, for example, if I go into the terminal and I try to do echo class path and it's all uppercase letters. And if there's nothing, then it looks at default locations for, for uh, where to find things. And uh, usually those default locations would be like uh, Java home. Where if it's not, then if it's not defined, usually um, it is on the path wherever Java was uh, was installed. So if we went and said uh, user bin Java, usually it's pointing to like something else. But if, you know, if we're in the...
you're going to see that a lot of, you know, a lot of Java files will lock, will come in and it is, it, it could look for all these Java files. Well, let me backtrack. Sorry. <laughs> Once you have the package and you want to distribute it, there is this zip file that you can press everything into. And that is known as a Java as a Java file. Basically, if I copy, let's let's grab these uh, jar files. Let's let's grab that jar file and um, and copy it here into this directory. Right now we have our jar file that is in the in here, and it's going to. Um, going to show it it's right here right i just copied a random java file and i'm going to show you something like just to help you understand the underlyings of java let's make this guy a little bit big um, and let's find that jar file this file right here that's the one that we just copied if i go ahead and edit the file and i remove the jar, the jar file and put dot zip and I'm saying use zip extension. Now it's a zip file. If I extract it, oh, why is it not doing it? Hang on, maybe that one is corrupt. But let, let's just, I know I know of other files. Let's see. Um, dev, and we have Neo4j community, and let's just copy some of the Neo4j. Neo4j is a, is a graph database, really fast, really powerful database but I'm not going to distract you with what it is, but I'm going to copy one of the, one of the files like um, Neo4j command line. That is essentially, I'm going to copy it here. And then I'm going to move these Neo4j command line file. Essentially I'm renaming it to a zip file. Same thing what I was doing with a, with a UI. And then if, uh, oh, I already have this guy. So now I have Neo4j command line. If I unzip it, double click it, unzip Neo4j. And you can see now um, it, it actually opened up a new package. You're gonna see how it refreshes here. It added met, meta inf and these, all these classes. And you can see that now all these files that were compiled by Neo4j are there. Now, I don't have to do anything manually here. I don't have to do this ever because as long as the, 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 the jar file isn't in the class path, it will find it. How do I do that? Okay, well, let me, let me just, you know, like for example, if I wanna open this guy, it's gonna reverse engineer it. And now I have, I can see the, the, the file, but we know that there's a command uh on on the neo4j you know org neo4j command line utility so we're going to just delete it this never existed this never existed uh and you know we are even removing the zip file as if it had never existed i'm not going to modify the class path in my terminal i'm going to modify it in this particular case in in the runtime here, edit configurations. And on this window, I can uh, I can either you know change the the actually no it's it's in the project project structure. I can add libraries in general here. So for example, if I wanna just grab these li libraries, I can point out to where did we have this file? Oh, we had it from, sorry. It is dev neo4j. Uh, lib, and I can just you know 
essentially I'm going to say to point out that added essentially the entire Neo4j repository available for me to uh, to now start using those classes. So for example, I can do import org neo 4 j Now you can see that I have all those packages available for me. This is so basically I'm showing you how to install third party packages in case that you want to use that. Are they in my in my in my structure here? Not really. You saw that those jar files contain pre-compiled Java files. And by me putting that directory where all those jar files live, it made them available to the project. And I'm sure that I confuse the hell out of you guys. So let me then get some numbers. So that way I can repeat the things that are, might not be clear because this, this is, a, this is a, a little bit of a confusing part about uh, Java. Just want to make sure that you guys understand the language. We, we don't have to do this from terminal. Can we just, we can, if we're using a Mac, we can just drop the yeah. files from a finder, right? Absolutely. And if you're using, you know, a, a Windows, there's ways of like changing the, the global environment variables on Windows or even on Mac and things like that. Uh, but yes, you can, the, I, I was just showing you like the command line stuff because I move faster on the command line than, than on the graphic stuff. But just what I, the main key takeaway is the, in those, the way to distribute application ready files Java files that have been compiled from the .java extension to the .class, essentially like distributing your application, is by grabbing and repackaging all those packages into this zip file. Now, there's a command line utility that does create jar files, which is essentially jar. And that will tell you, you can, you can create the zip files or extract them if you don't want to have to manage things around and things like that. JAR will create those Java archives. That's what JAR stands for, Java archive, JAR. Um, and again, those archives contain compiled information that then you can distribute. If you want to use it in your application, you can do it, for example, with IntelliJ or modifying your class path. The class path is just essentially an environment variable of your machine. Who's familiar? Who's not familiar with environment variables here? I'm a little confused on, on what they are and like how do you set them and their purpose, yeah. I guess. Okay, so this is this this is gonna turn into more of a Unix class, but or or a Windows class, but that's totally fine. Uh, because this is a this is the type of thing that I should have included in the curriculum. Um, so I'm giving it to you guys here. Um, so an environment variable is a lot of the times when you are working on a machine, you set up, there, there is this memory storage that is known as the, as environment variables. Some of those come to you for free because the computer set them up, but those allow you to pre-configure certain things that applications will rely on. The way to see what is in your, I mean, I'm going to show you in terminal. I, I, I don't remember how, to, or we can do a quick Google, but everything has environment variables. That's the way that, that computers actually like are configured to say, okay, where should I find this in your computer? What's the directory of that? How much memory do, you know, even Amazon web, web uh, secrets, AWS keys are often set up as environment variables. That is a way to configure the computer to do something with additional data. And it's a way to not hard code that data into the programs that you are running. On Linux or Mac or you know, any Unix-based system, I think in, in uh, PC, if you use the Linux subsystem, you can do this. Otherwise, I think, I think if you just use the keyword echo, it prints everything that is on the environment variable. On Mac is you print env, and that prints every single thing that has been predefined. The class path is similar to this thing. 
that there's another path variable, you know, known uh, throughout Unix systems that essentially says, this is where you look for programs to execute. The class path is very similar, but instead of saying, this is where you look for programs, is this is where you look for class files, for Java class files. So Juan, is there a path variable, or I guess a path environment variable for each directory that you're in? You can set up. You can set up some. I mean, for example, here this path directory. You can see this is yeah. this is where executables of binary programs of my computer will be. So when you are looking, you you see this entire long variable that was set up, but it's separated by these semicolons. Yeah, those semicolons are telling it. First of all, Unix. If you're gonna look for programs, so for example, if I do which Python. It's grabbing the one from my Anaconda directory as opposed to my user bin Python directory. Why? Because my class path has a higher priority. Where did it go? My, let me just, uh, uh, my class path is giving a higher priority to that Anaconda directory so that when the operating system is saying, okay, where do I need to find programs to execute? It's going to look, okay, is there that Python directory inside of this directory? And if it doesn't find it, then it goes to the next directory. And then it tries to find it there. And if it doesn't find it, then it goes and tries to find it, etc., all the way till the end. And then if it doesn't find it, then it happens this, where it says command not found. Same thing happens on the class side. Java will look for a default class path, but if I want to alter that, if I want to overwrite it, I set up an environment variable, which is essentially export class path uh, equals uh, user. I mean, I can do like the home. Uh, What's the name of? I know. Yes. J. Carlos. Oh, it's users. Um, uh, dev. Uh, Neo for J. Four point one lib. So I can say. If I, if I set up something like this, it's saying, hmm. look at the current path. Otherwise, continue looking at this one. Okay, so it and looks at, okay. Uh, but IntelliJ is doing that for us in here. That's why I went and, and did the project st structure. So that way it knows that it's going to find classes at this users, Moreno, Dev, Neo4j, community, lib directory. Did that help clarify stuff? Or did I just add a lot more information and now you guys are even more lost? Let's see. It's okay, if, by the way, if, if you guys are a little lost. Uh, I, I will find a way to you know correct it and clarify it. So, uh, Brandon, you're at nine, okay. How about everybody else? Okay. Uh, Leon, tell me, tell me what can I make it better with? Uh, it's just, I don't know, but I need to be like probably review to sort it out what's like, which, like each, each information is false. Like, like, uh, so you mentioned the classify is like, uh, class path is something like, uh, all computers sourcing for which program or which package we're looking for. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's not like bound into IntelliJ or something like that, right? It's like, uh, it's a Java thing. Okay, it's a Java thing. It's a Java thing. IntelliJ is just doing the job for us. We don't have to set up these command line stuff because yeah. we went here into file project structure. And now from that point on, now it's configured. But so it's already preset. I, I went and I did it by hand by, you know, going into file project structure. And that, you know, I added, I hit on this libraries and then plus and then i put that directory the moment that i remove that directory you're gonna see how it's oh 
it crashed. And and you're gonna see how it crashes. <laughs> you know? Um yeah, so while while it loads, sorry, you were gonna say something? Yeah, it's like uh, you add another like a customized uh, yes. uh directly to looking for more, you know, location to see whether the package is it or yeah. is it's not there. Here's uh, a perfect example of what something that we would need. Java doesn't have a built-in uh, JSON uh, format explorer, like interpreter. So we can download, you know, the, the Google JSON is actually really good and really fast. So we could download that one and use that, that API or uh, connecting to a database. If we want to download the driver of how to connect and interact with that database, we download that jar file and use it in our packages. Okay, for example, if if I wanted to, you know, add another program or add another class from the third parties to my working environment, yeah. Uh, so the one way is we just put it in the SRC, which is our default yeah working environment. The other way is just using the uh uh all the Unix language in the local uh, in the command to do mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Yeah, because it gives you the, the capability of that where you can have a centralized repository of all the packages that you have. And let's assume that you have two or three programs that you're writing, Java, you know, you have three projects and all of those use a MySQL driver. Rather than copying the driver in three different locations, you can set it up in one single path and then tell Java, look for extra stuff in these directories. And that would be a shared directory that all the, all the three applications that you're writing or the three projects that are separate from each other would actually look for. Got it, got it. Can you show me one more time how to add the path, you know, in the command? Not yeah, in, in the command line yeah. is usually like uh, n prints all the environment variables. So you are gonna see like, for example, uh, it doesn't have a, the, right now the class path, like, but if I do export class path equals, and I put a dot, that means this directory, semicolon, I can do like um, uh, dev uh, neo for j community 4.1 lib. And now I have those, those uh, via the command line. I mean, if I now do n via grab class, now we have the class path defined there. Okay, okay, got it. So Juan, is is that class path that's per project? Is that the idea, like you're setting a new class path? Yeah, that and that we're going in a different in a different uh, conversation because the fact that I set it up on this command line here in the command line right here, doesn't necessarily make it that if I open a new terminal, it's gonna work, that's per, per terminal. So that's why there's configuration files to like set up uh, environment variables like that. But the better way to like do it per project in that situation, I would recommend going into file project structure and then setting it up in the libraries area. So is that creating like a virtual it's like creating the exactly. It's creating the 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 environment variable virtually via because every time that we're doing this, the run thing, it's creating a new process, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I cannot count that these variables are going to be set. So I can count that the project will be set up correctly. Okay. Okay. All right, Josh, you were the other one that was in uh, eight in the eights. No, I'm good. I'll be fine. I just wanted to review, if I review the video, I'll be fine. Perfect. So then speaking about then, then before I burn you guys out, let's do our 20 minute break right now. I'm going to pause the recording and then I'll see you here at 831. Okie doke. Um, oh, screen sharing is paused. I got to resume sharing. Okay. So, um, where we left it then, we understood everything there is about packages. We know that they're used for grouping uh, information. We know that it's 
for grouping and organizing, it's also used for namespacing. It's also used for um, for distributing the, the files, you know, as a, as a Java archive. Uh, we also talked about the class path and even environment variables. Um, there's some other topic then that I would like to cover in the agenda. There's actually a couple of things that we want to do, but uh, most importantly, let's co let's cover standard input and standard output um, in in our agenda. So we talked about um, Java, I mean, operating system environment variables. And let me go back to my quick time thing here. Um, we discussed that um, that you know the operating system actually is it's, it's a tool of the operating system to like place variables that would be read by any process that has that has access to them. Um, there's another concept in general uh, that you know just the same way that we've been doing the main function as the main function is a, the function that Java understands as uh, as the place the entry point for your program um, for your application. You know that's that's the entry point the the main app, but any process. Let me just make this a little thinner and that way I can write it a little bit nicer. Any process in Java has a file that is an input and one file that is an output. Uh, this file that is an input is known as standard in. And this file that is the output is known as standard out. Standard in is usually the, the keyboard entry towards, um, you know, in the most basic operating system, you guys probably only know operating systems from a perspective of a UI and all those things, but an operating system actually provides like much more lower level and basic stuff than any UI or things like that. An operating system would actually provide, uh, uh, well, some basic instructions, basic, um, it will provide access to the, to the file system and management of the file system. Uh, it will provide uh, access and management of uh, connected devices. Um, and that also might, you know, the combination of both of these is ba includes basically like network connections and understanding how to connect things, you know, with other devices and things like that. Um, and, you know, in, a, in very simple terms, I'm just gonna try to like keep it as very simple. It also provides process management. Um, and in that process management, every application, every process, every app that runs has this, at the very least, these very much, uh, these, these uh, entry points and outputs. So if we have, you know, standard input is the keyboard and standard output is essentially the monitor, or at the very least it was in the old computer systems, you know, when you had just a terminal and a keyboard, similar to the terminals that, you know, uh, I think still are like that, like the point of sale at the guitar center and things like that, that are like super old school. And I think they have updated them, but sometimes they have like those green screens that it's like 80 character terminal, like super, super, super old school. That's basically the minimum uh, thing. So um, 
if you have then by default those initially, when you had a, pro a process and you were typing, you know, let's actually talk about standard input and standard output. Let's do a new class here. And we're gonna do standard in out, in and out. We should have called it in and out and then gone to in and out, but we're not in Westwood right now. So um, standard output, you guys already know it is basically this system.out.println. This is standard out. And whenever you have uh, uh, any program or an app, the way to, to access standard in because it's a file is system.in. Uh, so there's this particular class that makes it really easier on us, which is known as a scanner. Equals, equals new scanner. And basically this application, uh, you notice that it's in red. What do I need to do to like not make it red? Who, who can help me troubleshoot that? You don't have the, you don't have the class. You don't have access to the class. Okay, and how do I fix it? Just, um, I guess you can press all enter or, and then it'll import the, oh, I don't know if it's, is it on Mac? It's import class, yeah. Yeah. Java. And so I'm importing the one from Java util. Now the import Java util appears and then that makes that thing go away. So the scanner class is a class a convenience class that allows you to read from any file, whether it's standard in or any file. We'll talk about files, I think next class. Uh, but the cool thing about this is that, for example, it can uh, allow us to say, for example, string name equals s.new s.next line. Uh, and then, I'm just going to add here for tell me your name. This is essentially like a more advanced hello world. So you're going to notice that in this program, we are reading from standard.in. It reads until it finds the next line and then it prints that correctly. So it says, tell me your name. I'm going to put J JC and then it has hello JC. If I wanted to say, for example, let's just put it like that. Oh, actually, it's backwards. Oh, yeah, I had it correctly. Tell me your uh, age. And then we can say int integer age equals s the scanner dot next int and now i can read a number so if i put all my information correctly i can say hello jc you were born in and then i'm gonna put um well i'm just gonna hard code it for now just to not have to just to make it like super simple. Okay. So I'm gonna put, I don't know, JC, and I'm just gonna use any, any number. Let's see, I am 35. And then if I was 35, I would be born in 1986. So you saw how I got two different data types using the same scanner because it actually is looking for data that you're specifying. What would happen if here I gave it something that is not a number? So I'm gonna be again, what's your name, JC? What's your age? And I'm putting that text. And now it's saying, ah, 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 you were supposed to create an integer 
and you gave and what you gave me is not correct. So far, everybody's following. Yeah, let's get some numbers about following this part. Now that I know that everybody's following this, there's a couple of things. You can notice that there's three colors that IntelliJ is actually coloring things, coloring three things differently, just for visual understanding. Anything in, in this white grayish, anything in that color, it is standard out. Anything in green is standard in. Then what happens, then what is this red coming from? Any thoughts? From the compiler? Uh, it's coming from the runtime. But the runtime has a third file that it dumps data to. And this was created so that way you don't have logs or extra developer information. When you only have one terminal and one keyword, which is how computers were initially, you have to be able to dump computer information to a different file. So that way programmers can go back and look at that, those logs and see what happened without disrupting the user. So there's another file that is outputting to that is known as standard error or STD error, standard error. So now, for example, what happens if I change, uh, sorry, this number here, and if I change it to error, you're gonna see that whenever I'm printing that uh, JC, and I'm gonna put, uh four years old i was born in 2017 you see this one is red because standard error it's where i printed it now i'm gonna show you you know in unix this is this is more like unix stuff and and i'm just gonna show you how to split those two outputs because right now everything is putting being put basically on the same log but if i was capturing that information I can do, uh, I'm gonna compile the, the class by hand by saying std in out. And then I'm gonna run that std, std in out dot Java. Oh no, not dot Java, sorry. Dot class, just running it like this. Tell me your name, JC. See here it's not coloring, it's IntelliJ who's doing the coloring. Here the terminal is just printing it in the same way. And I'm gonna uh, put, the, I don't know, three. In this particular case, it just, there's no definition, there's no distinction in color of what standard input or output we were using. So if I did then something like this, this essentially redirects dev, uh, standard, standard error to the trash to be ignored. So you're going to see JC and I'm going to put the same H3. It did not print you were born in 2018. This is how we allow things to go into the log and not be captured by the main process. So to recap, we have three files that come with every single process, standard in, standard out, and standard error. That's how we handle the most basic input and output. And also to recap on this, we created um, the scanner in the, the scanner class to be a way for us to read from standard in and collect the information that we want in the way that we want it. Rather than reading it character by character and reading, you know, like a normal file, we're using convenience functions that the scanner has for us to, um, to read things faster in a much more convenient way. Okie doke. Any questions about this? Juan, well, I'm a little confused. Why are you passing that standard in to the scanner? Because why, I'm telling why? the scanner where to read from. The scanner is versat versatile enough that I can pass a file mm. 
and that file would be able to be read by by this by the scanner. So let me actually do that. Actually, let, let me even just you know. So are you saying that system.in is a file? Yeah, system. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I'm saying. System.in or standard in or yeah. and system.out or standard out or system mm -hmm. error and standard error, all these are files, are provided to the process as files. Okay. They're virtual so files. They don't exist on the file system. They don't exist on the hard drive. They're virtual okay. files. But the, okay. and, and even network, like uh, the operating system in all of these functions that I laid out here, it does it in a similar way for a lot of things, networking, uh, networking uh, is handled also as a file. Uh, streaming is uh, handled as a file. There's a lot of things that are handled as files because it's an easy mechanism that it's pretty universal. So is that like the only thing that, we'll, so we can pass like standard in, dot in or sorry, system dot in and then system, we can also pass like system dot out and then system dot error. Technically yes, scanning. but but you're not gonna scan anything because it's not like, it's not reading anything. Unless okay. you wrote to that. I don't okay. know, let's experiment. This is a good question. Well, no, it needs to be processes. Maybe, maybe by using a, 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 a multi-threaded, we probably could could do that. But um, seems like so a way, so way to think of it is just system.in is a virtual file you're passing to the scanner. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's like yeah. an object or something. Yeah, it's and actually, hot. let me show you then what would happen when we do new file. And let's actually open up the same source file. I'm gonna pass you know, oh, import class. And we're gonna pass, what's the name of this? STD in out dot Java. We're gonna read the same source file. And this guy's now complaining that, you know, when we're opening up a file, I'm going to, for now, uh, add this guy here, just ignore it for now. We're gonna talk about exceptions soon. Um, and I, then, then from this point on, I can do while s dot has next, uh, there has next line, yeah. <clears throat> This is a way of like reading the same source code and writing it out. Oh, it's gonna it's not gonna find the file. So let's put the, this guy. So dot next line is it's reading, yeah, it's reading line by line by line by line. You see the same source code, it read itself. Okay. Oh, okay. Do you guys need a couple minutes to copy this one on the previous system.in and system.er? So that next line is not a method specific to system dot in. No, it's to the scanner. Yeah. yeah. Let me, you know what I'm going to do? Hang on. Let me give you a couple minutes for this, but before we do that, I'm gonna do and I'm gonna copy the contents of this guy here and I'm gonna reset it to where we were. Okay, we have that. And then I'm gonna new file std out in out two. And I'm gonna put these two side by side, split right and split, there you go. So I'm gonna give you, should I give you five minutes for you guys to copy it?
Yeah, five minutes should be enough. Uh, Okie doke. So, uh, as a as a co general comment, why do I make you guys copy everything like that as opposed to just sending you the files as a digital version? Because it does help uh, to it does help you to understand the tools better if you are retyping things, especially you know simple things like this are not too bad and uh, and it does give you a little bit of you know even even uh, seeing what works what doesn't work and and figuring that out does it did everybody finish copying yeah let's see uh, I suspect that Josh is done copying because he finished a while ago Brandon you nodded um, Ali are you oh okay Jose raised the thumbs up uh, I don't, do I see Ali anywhere? Did, is Ali still around? I didn't see him. He probably left. Uh, let me just see. Participants, 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 participants. Yeah, Ali, Ali at some point. Sareth, are you, the, were you able to copy? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Leon, you were able to copy? Okay, cool. So then everybody's on, on the same page. Okay, also this is an important thing. The, the thing that I was actually showing you um, is important for, for the assignment. Why? Well, before we go into that, I want to show you the next concept that is also important for the next assignment. And this is another data structure. Our data structure, this is one of the most important ones and uh, that exists. And um, I, I used to say this before uh, being a, a Google employee, but I can tell you that, you know, hash tables are actually important in every tech interview. It's a very important uh, um, data structure because let me just explain something. If we are thinking about linked lists, every data structure has um, the capacity, the, a thing of, you know, let's assume that it has X elements, A, B, C, D, and E. Um, if we wanted, and I'm just gonna start throwing names in here just to, to make the class a little bit more interactive. So feel free to unmute so to be ready. Um, let's say Leon, um, in this particular, if we wanted to find the letter D, and obviously, you know, this is a linked list, how many nodes would we have to visit to find the letter D? Um, I'm sorry, you mean you're asking how many nodes we're going yeah. to visit? So if, if I want to find the letter D here, how many, how many jumps do I have to do? Two? Yeah, it's essentially one and then two. Okay, how many elements do we have on this list, uh, Jose? Four elements. Okay, so we have four elements, okay. And uh, um, Sareth, how many elements would we have to visit if we, have, if we wanna find the, the end of the list? Say that again. How many nodes do we have to visit if we if we want to find the end of the list? Four. Four. That means that for a list that has uh, four elements, the um, worst operation for count for uh, finding a number, it's going to be four. In other words, if we have a list of n elements, that operation is gonna be of n elements. And this is what it's called as uh, big O notation. I can spare you of the, of the terms of the entire thing because that's something that we see on Java 2. But basically this will tell us how much, how inefficient or efficient an algorithm is. In other words, um, 
if we had a list of a thousand, the, the longer the list, the more work we have to do. And if we were going to chart, you know, time versus operations, this is an O N. I, I forgot if time goes in here or operation, but you know, let's put it like that. If we had an operation that is exponential, actually the way that it actually is, is backwards. The number of operations uh, that, that, you know, that yield a good result versus time. If we're going in an exponential way, that means that we're not, we're performing, we're taking a long time to perform a good output. And that's an inefficient algorithm. Right now, don't quote me on this, like it's Monday morning, I mean, Monday night and I've been, but bottom line, and this is the thing that you can quote me on, is that uh, O notation determines that it's, it's a metric for determining how inefficient an algorithm is. So a linked list, we know that, you know, for finding or inserting a, an element because the insertion goes till the very end of the list and that's where you would put the new one. It's an ON operation. So the hash table is a data structure that is extremely efficient. So um, because it relies on pairs of keys and values and the keys have to be unique, the values are not. Why, uh, so for example, what is a good example of key pair values that, that would work? So for example, uh, capitals of the world. And if we have capitals of the world, we can have, uh, let's say, uh, obviously, you know, the US and the, the, its capital is Washington DC. And let's throw another country, let's say Australia, and the capital is Sydney. And we have, um, I don't know, France. Come on thing. And the capital is Paris and the UK and we have London. And, you know, Japan and we have Tokyo. Okay, so when we have those kind of key pair combinations, the US doesn't have multiple capitals. It only has one capital. So, so for each one of these. So again, the, uh, it, a, a, a hash table is a table that consists of a key, value, a key object that points to another value object and the key is unique. Now, this, particular hash table is really fast so much that any operation that you perform is of a magnitude of one single operation as opposed to a linked list that it's of an O N operation. So how does this hash table create, it's possible to do that in a single operation, whereas a linked list, it's logical that you will have to traverse the list to find out you know, how many elements are there. So the way that it works is by invoking a function that is known as a hash function. And a hash function, basically what it does is that given an input to that function, it will create a single output for that uh, function for that input. Meaning that if we put hello, it's going to consistently, you know, create some sort of reference to C uh, 0x16d, you know, let's put in a, in a hex that not notation. So then it's going to say, okay, well, I know that hello is going to be stored in this location. Um, so every time that we, you know, over or insert the same value twice, like for example, if we want we're doing capitals of the world, 
Guatemala had Antigua as a capital city. And then they later, they decided to change it to um, Guatemala City. Same thing with Brasilia, it had Brasilia and now it's Sao Paulo or vice versa. Let me just check that because I had it here on the example. Okay, I had it right here. Yeah, it was Rio, now it's Brasilia. It was backwards, I had it backwards. So the capital was, was changed. So, but so when, you know, we're using the same thing here, when we're putting in a, in a hash table, well, first of all, we invoke it by calling new hash table and using the put operation, we can put a key and a value in the hash table. And that's an O1 operation. It's fast as doing a single operation. That's what we consider it. Uh, all of these are the same. You know, Once we get to Brazil, at this line execution, it would create the Brazil capital as Rio de Janeiro. And then the next, in the next line, we overwrite it with Brasilia. Um, Hash tables are very powerful in that sense that you can point, you know, any object to any other object. Um, but the main op the main thing is that it's going to be really, 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 really fast. Um, and um, so let's actually implement this. Let's let's copy this. I'll, I'll let you guys copy it. Let's actually give you like three minutes to copy this and execute it. And then I'm going to select somebody random so that we can then verify and go through the debugger uh, and, and look at how all these values change. Okay. So let's actually make it four minutes because otherwise I'm assuming that you guys are super fast type, typer. So four minutes. Awesome. Okay, uh, let's pick. Let's let's grab a victim here. Uh, Jose, why don't you present for us? Let me stop presenting, and let's walk through together on this. Can you see my screen? Yeah, I, I can see it perfectly. Okay, so uh, do me a favor. On line eight, at the like, click on line eight, basically right there. Yeah, there you go. Now right click. And on, on, the, on the text editor, sorry, on the white part, there you go. And then you right click and run debug hash table dot main. Okay, so now we're in debug mode. Here's, so you can see that the, the hash, the map is, it has a, a size zero. You see it down below where it says, uh, oh, or in both, in, even in the same line where you're running it. But also you see it below where it says uh, the variables. So go into the controllers of the debugger, um, a little bit below, move your cursor below, 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 there, a little higher, there, to the left. And then you're gonna find the one with a blue arrow that it's pointing down. Okay. Yeah, and then click on that. So now we added USA, you know, that's going line by line on our code. So we're gonna click USA and it says now that the that it's USA Washington DC. If you can right next to it, it says variables, expand the map. It has a little arrow to your right. If you move out there a little bit below, a little, a little, a little tiny bit there, expand it. So now leave it, leave it open like that. You're gonna see that it's USA Washington DC. So then now let's go into the next line. And it says that it's uh, one, uh, one single thing. So then we read UK London, it added that, it was a fast operation. And then when, if you click on that uh, next one, Canada is added, now we have three elements. And let's click on another one where we're adding Brazil, uh, Rio de Janeiro. You're gonna notice that then once we uh, go into the next line, the line that the, in, the entry for Rio de Janeiro it became Brasilia. It overwrote, the, overwrote that because the key is unique and it points to the value. Just 
In some other uh, uh, computer languages, they call them dictionary. In Python, for example, in JavaScript, they call them object. Uh, in uh, Java, it's known as hash table. There's also another one that is a hash map. Both of them are pretty much identical. One is just for uh, multi-threaded or not, but that's a Java 2 thing. OK, uh, that's good enough. Thank you, Jose, for, for being the, the presenter. Victim? All right. Um, why are, are, are hash tables relevant? Like I said, you know, it's a very important uh, data structure so much that whenever you're trying to optimize uh, something and you, you know, rather than having a list in some cases, it's actually more useful to have it in a, in a hash table and where you just inserting it at a really fast speed. Now, the question is, remains of then how does this thing work? Uh, we understand the function, but we don't understand still how it's writing the information. I'm going to give you a hyper simplified version of a, of a hash table. Um, whereas, you know, if you guys remember, you know, if we go into this uh, super, super, super simplified version. Where we have our, our memory, and if we're going to say, you know, now we're going to put the US and we're going to put that function through through that, it might tell us that it's living on this address. So then DC will be written here. And every time that we're asking for this address, I mean, for uh, US, it's going to it's going to retrieve this value from here. And then if we do uh, France, then we put that through the function and then it's going to, you know, essentially say that this other function is not necessarily like it's in, in order or anything like that, but here it's going to put Paris and then, and so on. So basically the function is just giving us a shortcut to try to find uh, where it's living similar to one an array. When we have that, um, the indexing, it just tells us where to jump to try to that to get, get that information. Okay. Um, any questions about uh, hash tables slash, you know, uh, in other languages, dictionaries or whatever you want to call it? Uh, let's let's maybe get some numbers, but let me just get a separator so that way I know where is the last one. Okay. George understands it. Jose understands it. Josh and uh, as well, Brandon as well. And let's see, we're, we're I'm missing uh, Sareth. Uh, I'm putting peer pressure on Sareth to, to uh, put his number. And it's coming together. I know he's typing it. He's thinking about it. Ah, there you go, there's a nine. Okay, everybody has a nine on, on the understanding of, of hash tables. Okay, so then why are all these guys important? As of now, for us in the short term with this class, it's very simple. The assign, we have an important assignment that I'm actually gonna lay down two assignments. One, the one due next week and the final project. Both of them, and, and I hate to say this, and maybe I should not say while I'm recording, but both of these have elements that you can resolve a good chunk of both uh, situations using the information that you got in today's class. Obviously with everything else that you've learned, but today's cl class is actually critical to answering both of these situations. Um, the first exercise, let's talk about it. The, this is a, the exercise that it's due on next week. This is a word counter. What is a word counter and why is it important? To put it in the simplest, in the simplest terms, uh, to put all that in this much, much, much more simplest terms that we can, a word counter is, in a way, uh, an algorithm that searches for relevance of words. And I'm going to put it in absolutely dumb terms. I'm not going to go into um, page rank or anything like that, but Google is a word counter to a degree. Um, and how are we going to count words? Well, this, this code here that I'm giving you is a baseline for your project. Essentially, I am giving you 
a, a base code that it's reading a file in, I couldn't, for copyright purposes, I couldn't put the Beatles a day in the life lyrics. So I put the presidential spe speech of uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt or FDR. Uh, but basically I want to know how many instances of each word are in that in that particular exercise or in that particular file. So for example, I'm going to do it, do one by hand and I'm going to um, do it in this year. I'm going to do a very, uh, a sample by hand of a very powerful, poetic and a gem of the English literature that it's known as Baby by Justin Bieber. And you can see on this song, the lyrics um, lend themselves, where is this? No, this is not it. Is it Baby O? Where is that? Which one was it? Let's see. Well, which one was it? Uh, is it this one? Oh, yeah, it's this one. Justin Bieber lyrics. Google has it wrong. So I'm maximizing this so that you guys can see the, the lyrics. So basically, given all these texts, and I'm just going to do the first line just because I know that I can get away with repetitions on the first line. That's why. I'm doing it with this song, not because I'm a Justin Bieber fan and I have nothing against Justin Bieber fans. I just, this song <laughs> lends itself for the example. So given all of our text, we're gonna go and see, okay, I have a hash table where I'm going to be storing all this information. And in the hash table, I am going to put the, I'm gonna see, and and I would like you know guys you guys to be unmuted so that you guys can help me answer this as I go and ask the questions. For then I'm gonna go and separate you know I get a through the scanner a line each line, and then from there I'm, I can use either the the split function or the string tokenizer function that actually will split that line into tokens or each word. So. When you know the scanner gives me this, then I'm gonna use a string tokenizer to go ahead and like split all these guys. So then I'm gonna, once I tokenize it, I am going to, and actually, why, why did I choose this particular one? Because there's one that actually has commas and maybe it's this one. And the one with commas is actually a little bit better. Actually, we can, yeah, we can, we can use, we can use this example, the chorus. We're going to use the, the chorus as opposed to the, to the, the beginning. Okay. So uh, we found the word baby with uppercase. Is it on our results hash table? Can anybody tell me if it is on the results hash table? What is it? Should be. Should be. Is it? I don't. Do you see it here? Oh. Okay. So no. so no. Okay. So then, because it's no, then we're gonna put it here, and we're gonna point the value. How many iter How many times we've seen it? How many times have we seen it so far? Because we are. We are right here. How many? One. One time, okay. Okay, then we go into the second word. Oh, but by the way, we found it as baby comma. If we are going strict by just looking at it, the next one is going to be lowercase baby comma. Ba do we did do we see do we see baby comma lowercase on on the hash table? No. Okay, so if we were going to do this we will then have seen each one of those at the same time. Now, this is incorrect for a word counter because what we need to do is that each word, we need to clean it up. Meaning that it doesn't matter if it comes as baby comma 
or baby comma or just baby or baby or b a b y or you know doesn't matter what combination of uh, we get all of these will come back as baby we are removing special characters we are removing uppercase and lowercase by making forcing it to be lowercase and then that's the one that we com that we compare so if we did our cleanup function let's assume that we do a cleanup function on each word as it comes so we're going to start then reading again baby comma we apply cleanup function and it comes out as what baby baby what is it baby baby uppercase lowercase comma with comma all lowercase lowercase with comma or without comma uh, probably with the comma. what is it brandon i couldn't hear well ideally you'd get rid of the comma okay yeah. we get rid of the comma our cleanup function is the, that number one step okay so is that cleaned up baby in the, in the results hash table no yet okay so then we we do a put operation and we we put it with baby and the value of one right yeah <clears throat> then we go again and then we get baby lowercase and we put it through our cleanup function and it's going to yield what Baby. baby. Just baby without a comma. Is it on the on the hash table? Yes. Okay. What's the value? One. How many times then have we seen it? Twice. So it'll replace the one. So we add one more. So now it's two. Mm -hmm. Then we go into the third word. I'm going to point it out this third word. This third word didn't come with a comma. But after our cleanup, it's going to come up again as baby. Have we seen it on the hash table? Mm -hmm. What's the value? Three. Then we add three plus one because, I mean, two, it was value of two, but then plus one, we put three. Then we are on this O. Okay, in O, it's removing special characters. Now our current word is O. Is that on the hash table? Nope. No. Then because it's not on the hash table, we add O and we add it with value of one and so on. This is why I chose this song because in one single line, I can actually repeat something three times. So um, essentially with all the file, we're gonna be count counting the words this way. And I would like just, you know, if you see something else that adds like top 20, ignore that. All I'm looking forward is for, for you guys to tell me how these things count. And, and I'm, I have an expectation of certain things to be cleaned out. Uh, and, and I have, a, you know, I know the right answers to things. So that's the thing that I'm going to be paying attention. But basically, that's the assignment uh, for, for uh, next week. Any well, questions about this? Yes, Josh. I was just saying you could use Paul McCartney's Say, Say, Say as another song. You actual, know what? I'm going to use that on the next uh, semester. Yes. But it's got say, 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 and then he does another word that rhymes with A in the next verse. So. I'm going to use that one. I prefer to use that than uh, I have forgotten about that. Good catch. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Any questions about, about this? Nobody? Okay. The, fourth, the good thing is that everything is recorded on the video. So I just gave a lot of information there and you guys are gonna be able to go back and rewatch it and, um, and cover that. Okay, next thing is the final project. The final project is a currency exchange thing. And I'm sure that you guys have traveled or have dealt at some point with currency exchange. You know, Now with the popularity of cryptocurrencies, that is also another currency exchange. So I'm giving you a file with all the symbols of currencies at, as of one point, I think in 2017 or something like that. Um, those currencies are against the US dollar. So my expectation for the final project is that you're gonna read that file, 
essentially you, you already saw how to read a file today. You are going to populate the symbols to the numbers and then prompt the user via standard in, which you already saw today. And I would recommend you that you use the data structure that you learned today to also populate the, the hash table with all these currencies and say, okay, this currency is worth this much. You're going to prompt the user, tell me the amount, tell me the currency that you're converting from, and then tell me the currency that you're converting to, and I'll tell you the number. So, so that in certain situations, for example, uh, $3,000, 3000 Australian dollars become 42,000 Mexican pesos. Um, basically that's, and, and you know, um, this one, this one has a little bit of a bigger criteria. I'm expecting it that it doesn't crash. I'm expecting it that it works, that it, that I can actually try to push it a little bit and that it won't fail. Any questions about this currency exchange final project? Do, do we need to use all of those data structures or is that just like an option? Well, like it says array, it's, it's array. You have a data structure. I want to see a data structure there. But not all three necessarily. No, not all three. Not all three. Not all three. If you if you think about it, I mean, this might sound a little bit more daunting, but it's basically very similar to the other one. I just I'm just trying to like get you guys, you know, to resolve problems that that are simple enough that you are not really thinking too much about how to solve the problem, but how to actually get get this thing working well. Okay. Um, then if there's no questions on any of the assignments, then for those of you that don't have any questions, class dismissed. I'll see you next class.